Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and esteemed colleagues. Welcome to the, today's main event. I am Omar Kniaw, Professor of Applied Mathematics and Computational Science, Chair of the 2018 Enrichment Program. It is a special pleasure today to introduce today's speaker, Professor Ahmed Goniam of MIT. Don't worry, Ahmed, it's not another thesis, I assure you. Uh, Ahmed is the Ronald C. Crane Professor of Mechanical Engineering at MIT, the Director of the Center of, for Energy and Propulsion Research, and the Director of the Reacting, Reacting Gas Dynamics Laboratory. I've known Ahmed for a long time as instructor, graduate advisor, examiner, postgraduate advisor and mentor. I've always known him, even from soon after meeting him, to be a strategic thinker and a charismatic leader. I've learned a great deal from Ahmed, of course, in science and engineering, and also in many dimensions that clearly transcend graduate research and education. Professor Goniam is world-renowned leader in several areas, including computational engineering, turbulence and combustion, multi-phase flow, clean energy technologies, renewable energy, and fuels. He is fellow of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, the American Physical Society, and the Combustion Institute. He has received several awards, including the ASME Potter Award in Th Thermodynamics, the AI AIAA Propellant and Combustion Award, and the Kaust Investigator Award. Professor Kugonium is no stranger to the kingdom, nor to Kaust, he has led several projects with Saudi industry and universities and was the recipient of a KAUST GCR award. Ahmed, it's a pleasure to have you back at KAUST and we are very much looking forward to your keynote. Thank you very much, Tom. After this introduction, anything I say is downhill, right? <laughs> well, uh, <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be back, and it's a pleasure to be introduced by Omar. I always tell him he was the first <clears throat> in the group, and he's still the best in the group. Um, I should start also by thanking both Kaus as well as, as uh, Professor Kaniao for inviting me to give this uh, lecture and to spend a couple of days back in Kaus. <clears throat> uh, Kaus is, as many of you know, uh, very uh, close and dear to my heart. I've been involved with it from the very beginning. <clears throat> I've known it as a concept. I've known it as a bunch of pictures. I've known it as a hole in the ground, and I have known it as a world-class university. <clears throat> and it's definitely nice to come back and see that what we thought should be 10 years ago is materializing. <clears throat> so if I can get my slide uh, on the Big screen. All right, very good. <clears throat> so, uh, so this is just a sort of a recap of my own personal interaction with the kingdom and, and the cows. Uh, my first visit here, believe it or not, was in January 2007 as a small group of MIT faculty and students. We were invited by Aramco to come in and visit some of the facilities, including um, <clears throat> the very impressive development in Sheba. Following that, we were given a short introduction about cows <clears throat> as a concept at the time, at which moment all of that said, wow, what are you thinking? A um, <clears throat> couple of years later, the next couple of pictures were taken when <clears throat> I uh, 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 was awarded uh, uh, the Cows Investigator Award and soon after the groundbreaking ceremony. Uh, the pictures on the other side are the more fun pictures that I took while I was on my sabbatical here in 2013 with some members of the faculty of the Clean Combustion Center and the uh, math group. Uh, with that, I'm going to start my, my discussion with you today, or my presentation, related to the concept of the future city. And <clears throat> as I have been told time and again, uh, stay at high level and stay as conceptual as possible and think big <clears throat> and just don't get lost in technical detail. And what I would, that's what I will try very hard to do. If I fail, please yell at me. Um, we have to start by thinking about energy broadly, 
<clears throat> many of you must have seen these sort of graphs before showing the primary sources of energy worldwide over the past 20 some years and projecting over another 20 some years. Showing, not surprisingly, that fossil fuels will remain the dominant source of energy worldwide, led by oil, <coughs> followed by coal and gas, although, as you can see, gas is rising very quickly and coal is leveling off, followed by oil, oil also expected to level off. Uh, somewhat surprisingly is biomass energy is rising. Uh, not surprisingly, wind and solar are rising very fast. So if you, you compare the first or even the second derivatives of these two graphs, you can see why we need to pay serious attention to renewable energy, in particular wind and solar, but also account for the role of biomass, as I will cover in more detail during the lecture. We should not lose track of the fact that fossil fuels will remain the dominant source of energy in the next 20, probably 50 years. On the other hand, what will be driving us to think differently is global warming and CO2. Again, not, not, no, no surprises here. There's a massive concern about uh, global warming, the rising temperature, um, um, uh, uh, potential uh, impact on agricultural, climate, water, uh, 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 land, <coughs> and so on, that led many to think about approaches to mitigate the uh, uh, problem by reducing CO2 emissions. So what you will see here are from the uh, uh, work, both from the International Energy Agency as well as the American um, uh, Energy Administration, showing uh, sort of the increase in the amount of CO2 emission with moderate policies to reduce CO2 emissions rates. Then several other scenarios, the most favorite at this point is the 450 scenario that will limit um, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere to 450 enabled by implementing three approaches accounting for significant improvements in energy efficiency, both generation and utilization, utilization of uh, clean sources of energy, primarily renewable, but also implementation of carbon capture and storage. Um, when thinking about new developments, new uh, uh, um, uh, sort of green field type development, <clears throat> one is very much forced to think along these lines. What can we do to bring into fruition these sort of visions that are uh, um, uh, at least conceptually uh, supposed to mitigate uh, CO2 effects? Now, the city of the future since that is the subject of, of the week, uh, I think we all agree should be a good citizen of the world. In other words, it should be uh, 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 participating in what the world concer concerns are and suggested solutions from different uh, uh, scenarios. Uh, what that means, it means that will be, or it should be a low, carbon footprint type development. Uh, but how do we do this? Well, they've already told us we need to re uh, deploy renewables at scale, and we need to make sure that renewables are being deployed at scale effectively to also increase energy storage. And we'll talk about that a bit more. Uh, <clears throat> we need to focus on energy efficiency, renewables, as well as concepts related to hybridization, combining fossil and renewable in efficient ways, and expansion of storage. Uh, clearly, if fossil fuels are going to continue to be a dominant source of energy, then carbon capture and storage is going to have to play a role, probably a significant role. Clearly, an alternative zero carbon energy like nuclear is going to have to expand and with that, alternative fuels for things like transportation and heating and so on 
will have to also be used. While thinking about it, one never can uh, forget the economic aspects of it. I believe that the economic aspects of it are very significant. And in fact, you can develop an economy around clean energy. And if you are a leader in the economy of clean energy, you capture a market that is undoubtedly going to grow. <clears throat> so I would like to very much emphasize the need for thinking about clean energy as an economic opportunity. Uh, clearly, clean energy is not going to happen by itself. It's going to only be based on sound science. So knowledge-based economy, supported by sound science, is going to have to lead the way for this development and implementation. And by saying something that uh, I'm sure due to your own heart as well, that that will require <coughs> more extensive research and development that we're, than we have been doing. All right, so I was asked to think about what the clean city of the future is going to do. Well, I'm not a, a, a developer, real estate developer or, or, or otherwise, and I decided to think back of my own personal journey, how I developed <coughs> my own uh, professional career, and I found that I tended to remain flexible in how I organize my research program to as much as I can address real life societal problems. So over, over the, the uh, uh, decades, if you like, <clears throat> I made shifts and expansion and contraction and accommodation to make sure that we stay relevant. I also tried very hard to integrate the activities within my profession, integrate my educational activities, my research activities, as well as my services. I tried very hard to work with teams <coughs> to make sure that we address real life interdisciplinary problems. I worked very hard to uh, be a citizen of the world, if you like. Uh, I travel overseas just about once a month um, I, I do that willingly, I don't complain about it, but I do it with a goal in mind to make sure that I'm connected with the world, that I'm not only focused locally. If I reflect <clears throat> on translating this personal experience into what is of the future, I'd like to think that this experience translates to the following. Um, the city of the future must remain very strongly people-oriented, must focus on people who live in the city, their quality of life, their prosperity, their health. It must be constantly looking forward. It must be thinking about new technologies, new developments, new knowledge. It must be flexible to accommodate and adopt to these changes. It must also be on one hand as much uh, independent as possible as we will say in more detail, but it must also seek collaboration. Um, call that import and export. You must be constantly <coughs> part of the world community. In order to succeed in doing this, and if we look around the world in places that succeeded in doing this, having a knowledge-based economy is a must having <clears throat> um, the, the, the willingness as well as the facility to develop knowledge and apply it is absolutely at the heart of such a development. So, um, where does energy fit in the city of the future? It's everywhere and almost everything. If the city of the future needs lighting, cooling, communication, transportation, <clears throat> um, education, mobility, that is driven by energy. If the city of the future needs water, that's driven by energy. If it is desalination or reclamation, that's driven by energy. If it needs food, it needs water to irrigate its fields, that will be driven by energy. If it needs to dispose of its waste in an environmentally clean way, exactly the same issue. 
<coughs> both as a, a, a way to cleanly dispose of the waste as well as to potentially generate energy out of it. The city of the future, um, again, uh, uh, using existing models worldwide, has its own local economy based on in part knowledge developed in it and in part, in part knowledge that it imports in a way that integrates with its own needs. That we call, as a, a word that has become very popular, the nexus. And the nexus here is really energy, water, food, and jobs. Uh, constantly we're talking about the energy, water, food nexus as a way of combining the needs and fulfilling the requirements. <clears throat> but I strongly believe that you need to connect that with jobs. You need to have uh, high quality jobs for people who live in that city <clears throat> in order to uh, 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 keep its prosperity. And if these jobs are connected with these needs and lead to a, a, a viable economy, uh, then we, we have we've, we've covered uh, quite a bit of ground. All right, now let's talk about some more detail. Let's see whether we can add some more meat to the bone. <clears throat> so we've talked about lead energy, we've talked about energy needs, we've talked about connection between energy and water and food and, and jobs. If the city of the future is going to have access to plentiful of energy, as potentially areas shown in the map uh, do, what will it do with it? <clears throat> and here I'm going to try, again, at a very, very high level, think about the role of the different technologies that are either available currently or are now being under development. How will it contribute to the city of the future as we're thinking about it. So we have a whole bunch of items. First, of, first one is using it efficiently. And if you use it efficiently, you will satisfy about 50% of the requirements of the International Energy Agency's targets by <coughs> um, mid-century. Uh, efficiency penetrates across everything building efficiency, insulation, glass, windows, um, uh, efficient heating and cooling system, combined heat and power, combined cooling and power, <coughs> efficient transportation, whether it's public transportation or self-driving transportation. I'm jumping outside my, my main theme, but it's very strongly believed that self-driving transportation will lead to significant reduction in energy used in transportation we can talk about that later if there's interest, as well as obviously hybridized power plants, uh, power, power uh, uh, trains. Uh, clearly efficient power plants, a plant that can convert your, your, your primary source of energy into whatever you need is part of the efficiency um, uh, uh, domain. So efficiency is at kind of at, at, the, at the very high level is what we're after and what we're hoping to gain about 50% of the target from. All right, the second one is, clearly the city of the future has to have some level of independence and, and some level of resilience. What do I mean by that? Independence as much as possible in terms of generating your needs, whatever you need, you would like to generate it locally. Enormous amount of energy is wasted by transporting both goods and services across long distances. Of course, if you cannot do it, you have to import it. If you can do it locally, you're going to gain significant uh, efficiency. Resilience means, in part, being able to do things locally because your, your disasters that can, can interrupt transportation lines and so on, I'm not going to, to hurt you, as well as having some redundancy, being able to switch one uh, source off and switch another source off. That typically leads people to think about distributed energy. Um, 
one example for distributed energy is very exaggerated, but, but, but brings the point home, is if your home becomes an energy independent island. If you put enough PV units on, on the roof of your house and you're uh, uh, in a sunny area, you can generate enough energy electricity for your own use. And if you have the right storage facility in your basement, you can store that energy that you can use later on when the sun is not out. You can store it in the form of, of batteries. Uh, battery technology is growing very steadily and, and um, uh, getting more cheap. But you also you can store it by converting to something like hydrogen by splitting water and have a hydrogen tank in the basement. It's good to have different options. There's no way we're going to all live with one, one single path of technology. We're not all going to be driving electric cars. We're not all going to be driving Ferrari Toyota Mirai, which is a hydrogen fuel cell car. And we're not going to all be driving combustion car using gasoline. We're going to be driving different <coughs> uh, 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 power trains depending on our needs. And it's good to think of what is the uh, scheme, what is the system that will allow us to switch between these different options. So truly distributed energy clearly will allow some level of energy independence at sort of the house or, or, or uh, building uh, or, or small community level. Uh, it gives you a chance to store your, your own energy, but it also gives you a chance, as happens in many countries now, to sell back to the grid. If you have excess energy beyond your need, you can always sell it back to the grid and make some money out of it. Clearly, that's not only uh, uh, expected to happen or should happen at the single house level, but it can happen at a city level or a commu large community level. Same scheme. You have sources of energy like wind and solar. It will give you electricity and heat. <clears throat> you can use that as, 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 as the raw energy, or you can use it as a way of storing that energy in the form of either fuel or electricity and use it back when you need it. It also gives you a chance to close the carbon cycle, as we'll, we'll, we'll say in a second, which uh, 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 goes back to the idea of using CO2 if we capture it and, and we'll bring it back in. The point I'm trying to make here is technologies that allow some level of independence, local generation and storage and continuous consumption of, of energy uh, uh, should and is going to play an important role of moving towards integrating renewable energies more effectively into the, into the system. Uh, that does not mean that we all have to be energy independent. There will be factories, there will be fab fabrication facilities, there will be uh, uh, services at a scale where production of energy uh, at the small scale is not possible, we're going to have to go back to the large scale. And we're going to go back to the large scale, we're going to go to either PV type farms, wind farms, or concentrated solar power type systems. Concentrated solar power systems have somewhat fallen off the favor lately because PV systems have become very cheap. You can argue that PV systems are cheap because China is monopolizing the market and that may not last forever. You could argue that that's a reality. That, that's a, that's a, a long argument to make. P, PSP systems do have the advantage of potentially cheaper storage, as well as easier integration with fossil fuels. And that's a very important point I'd like to stress, that as we think of deploying different forms of energy uh, conversion technologies, and capitalizing on different sources of energy, we need to think about how we're going to integrate them or hybridize them in a way that is most efficient and will free us from some of the flaws or, or, or uh, uh, complexities of dealing with each one independently. So C C CSP systems have been deployed in several places, some either steam storage, heat storage in the form of molten salt, and so on. 
and have been successful in, in, in demonstrating storage, but at a relatively small scale, maybe two, three hours at most, because the size of these uh, uh, tanks can get very large and they can get inconvenient. Perhaps a better idea of doing the same thing is to have natural gas available for the CHP system that as soon as the sun is out, natural gas will kick in and will provide the heat. This will reduce the cost because you don't need storage. In the meantime, will allow you to run the same power plant for as long as you want, whether you have the sun out or not. That's what I call integration and hybridization. Obviously, integration and hybridization calls for smart systems, systems that have sensors and actuators and smart controls over them that senses what the needs are and start to turn on <coughs> the right part of, of the system. Um, that goes back to what I, I've been talking about from the beginning, which is you need to have a knowledge-based economy that support that sort of development locally as well as obviously globally. Uh, those hybrid systems are, are starting to penetrate. This one was built in near Cairo in Egypt, and, um, and is, as far as I know, has been, has been running well. Uh, there are better ideas. Again, if you want to store at larger scale, you could potentially, instead of burn, burning the natural gas, you could use the solar energy to reform the natural gas and either uh, 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 generate hydrogen and store that hydrogen in the power plant until you need it. Or you can take that hydrogen and, and, and put it in pipelines to send it to homes for cooking and heating <coughs> and other applications. So variations on the same theme can be applied and many groups, including my own, are working very intensely on solar reforming and integrating uh, solar reformers with different uh, um, power plants, uh, solar uh, um, uh, CSP plants, <coughs> in order to achieve the goal that, that we set already. Uh, one thing I'd like to remind you of, um, while we are still debating whether we should be using solar energy or not, solar energy was deployed in this region at the turn of the, 19th, of the 20th century. These pictures were taken in Egypt in a place very close to where I was born and raised in 1913, where the first implementation, large-scale implementation of trough collectors was done by an American man by the name of Frank Schumann, who at the time was a prophet for, for solar energy and had predicted that, again, solar power was going to be the dominant uh, uh, energy source and energy form in the world for, for, for uh, uh, the ages to come. We know that that didn't work out, but this is the nature of these sort of concepts and technology <coughs> that they create excitement. You use them for a while until you find potentially other alternatives that fit the bill better and you switch them. Staying with the same theme and as a as again, uh, someone who's interested in history, um, uh, we're talking about change. We're talking about adjusting to forces that will encourage us or forcing, force us to adopt to different things. So I looked at the transportation history, and I spent just a bit of time Googling the web on what happened to transportation since the invention, you know, since, since people started to move. The first one I ran across was biomass. You get your donkey and you put it on a, a cart and it pulls you and you go where you are. Now, I'm not going to tell you what these things are for a second and I will give you a quiz later. As we developed more, we invented the internal combustion engine and we all were able to drive as long distances as we wanted, and all kinds of automobiles, that's just a, one example of it, using gasoline or diesel or derivatives or of either oil or some, some bio sources. Uh, more recently, as we became interested in diversifying fuel sources, same engines 
were shown to be drivable on hydrogen. You can drive your IC engine on hydrogen and it's perfectly happy. But IC engine and hydrogen may not be the most efficient system, so we brought in fuel cells and fuel cell cars uh, uh, were demonstrated. And in fact, as I said before, Toyota has a very viable demonstrator it, that's being tested in California now. Beyond that came the hybrid power train where we started integrating the battery, electric, electric drive, with an IC engine, and this is one version of it, and this is another version of it. It struck me that the hybrid power train is such an obvious power train, and why was it only invented in 2004 or five? Well, I was completely wrong, and I was completely right. The hybrid power train was invented in 1900. And it was invented by someone we know very well. His name is Professor Ferdinand Porsche. And he developed the hybrid car that you see here with him driving. And it looks like a massive monstrosity. It was a very fast car. Every single race he went in with this monstrosity, he won, but he could only sell three of them. Nobody wanted to buy this car. If you develop a technology nobody wants to buy, no matter what the attributes are, nobody is going to touch. These things are the same car, but having been refurbished recently. In, in his museum in, 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 in Germany. And in fact, this is really is the most advanced hybrid train you can find with motors built in the wheels. So Ferdinand Porsche, not only he designed the 911 that we all drool over, but he was also an excellent engineer <coughs> knowing that you needed to integrate a motor <coughs> with the wheel to get the most the maximum efficiency. But mother is also Uh, I'm sorry, but invention is also driven by need very, very uh, uh, um, uh, strongly. And people drove cars on coal or by a mass during World War when they could not find oil. So this is a car that was driven in Switzerland with a gasifier sitting in the back with wood being gasified and this pumped into the car to drive the engine. So, we need inventions, we need innovation, we need to be adaptable, we need to constantly change, and we need to keep in mind that technology, if it does not satisfy some economic needs and <clears throat> does not appeal to the users, will not be, never be deployed. All right, so let's move on and talk about storage. Again, renewable energy is going to be very difficult to live with as the only source of energy because of its intermittency. <laughs> and <clears throat> no matter how much sun you have, and no matter how much wind you have, the total wind and sun can give you traces like these while your need is somewhere up there. This is on a day basis. This is in Germany on almost one year basis. That the fluctuation in the renewable energy, and Germany is absolutely the leading country in the world currently in terms of deploying renewable energy, cannot satisfy your needs un unless you have either a backup or a storage system. We'll talk a bit about the backup one more time after we talked about the CSP, <clears throat> but let's talk a, bit, a little bit about storage and see where we are with that. Storage is very tricky because storage, especially at the scale of a city, now we're talking about a large development, a million people maybe, uh, at that scale, things become a lot more challenging than at the scale of a single house where you have maybe, you may have enough batteries. Storage depends on the geographic location, where you are, what's available for you. It depends on the source of energy you have, and it also depends on the scale at which you, 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 you want to store your energy. You may want to store it for a few hours. Batteries will do very well. If you start thinking about days, <clears throat> if you're going to address these kind of things, then you start to, uh, to talk about seasons, then you probably need to think beyond batteries. 
the two most common uh, uh, large-scale storage systems known are either hydropower or compressed gas storage. Pumped hydro, which is a system by which you can raise water to higher elevation when you have energy and let water flow down and run turbines when you need energy, is very popular and very common and used extensively and is considered probably one of the best uh, energy storage technology available, but you need to be in a place where you have water, plenty of water, and you need to have geographic and geologic formations that allow you to go up and down. You could build dams, but again, even dams require certain geographic uh, 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 formations. Uh, this is an example of a project that is still under study in Jordan, not far from here, where they're thinking of filling a big pit to, to create a lake by pumping water from the Red Sea, from Aqaba. <coughs> uh, again, uh, while energy is available and moving on. Thank you very much. I spent a few days in Morocco before coming here visiting the University of uh, King Mohammed VI. And uh, Morocco was beautiful, but was too beautiful for me. It has so many wildflowers because of spring, and I have terrible allergies since then. <coughs> so I apologize for my dry throat. Um, so that, that project in, in, in Jordan is, again, following the same principle. It was trying to create a, a large-scale energy storage facility that can help them <coughs> with uh, intermittency issues deploying uh, solar energy in that area. Um, the other two that I'm showing down here are all uh, uh, compressed air, where you use, again, compressors to send air downstream, down, down uh, um, under, underground <coughs> in big formations where air can be stored and then be used later <coughs> to run turbines. There are, again, depending on how willing you are to hybridize these systems, these systems can prove to uh, provide significant storage if, for instance, you're willing to hybridize air storage with natural gas, if it's just a matter of taking the air back <coughs> under pressure to run turbine, the, the, the storage capacity can, it goes down significantly. Ultimately, chemical energy density is absolutely the highest we know, next only to nuclear. We're not going to store energy in nuclear form, I can assure you that. But we can store energy in chemical form, either in storing natural gas, as they're doing now in Germany, or storing synthetic gas. And synthetic gas can be produced, obviously, <coughs> by electricity from renewables or by reforming natural gas, again, using heat from renewables. That's a, uh, a scale that you can go up as much as you want. Uh, <coughs> you can store gas for, for years. Uh, obviously, batteries are going to continue to play a very important role. We cannot give a talk on energy without mentioning Elon Musk and Tesla. And Tesla has certainly been <coughs> a leading company in developing batteries for storage, both at the home level as well as recently at a bit of an intermediate scale level. They developed a system for Australia <coughs> that is really remarkable in, in, in terms of uh, its advancement. All right, now let's talk about backup. Um, uh, since renewables are intermittent and we cannot only use renewables all the time, <coughs> backup can be fossil fuels. Germany still generates 40% of its energy from coal. That's a secret that no, not too many people know, <coughs> despite, despite the enormous deployment of, of, of renewables in Germany. Why? Because you need a backup. If sun and wind is not available, you're going to have to run your fossil plants. That guarantees that fossil fuels will remain <coughs> for a long time as a, an important energy source. But we can also think about closing the carbon cycle. We can also think about capturing some of the CO2, the exhaust gases, the CO2 on water, and put them through systems that, with external energy, can bring them back into fuel again. So again, that's supplying energy to the products of combustion of natural gas to break it back up into a fuel. 
then use that fuel in the power plant. So this way, you're sort of closing the carbon cycle. <coughs> you're not generating as much CO2 as you would have otherwise, since you're taking some of that CO2 coming out of the plant and using it to generate fuel. <coughs> More effectively, we need to think about CCS, carbon capture and storage. Carbon capture and storage is about separating CO2 from the combustion gases of gas plants, oil plants, coal plants, irrespective of the hydrocarbon you use, and compressing it and storing it underground. By itself, it's a, it's a complex technology. There's no question about it. And it's a technology that, that, that adds to the price of electricity, that adds to the price of the plant. Wouldn't it be nice if that technology that adds to the price of the plant can pay for itself somehow? The answer to that is mostly yes. In many cases, you can use the CO2 you're injecting underground to repressurize oil fields or gas fields that have run out of pressure. And by doing that, you do what's known as enhanced oil recovery or enhanced gas recovery, <coughs> by which, again, the CO2 you put underground <coughs> pushes some of the oil and gas available uh, up. It generates fossil fuels indeed, but in the meantime, we are uh, replacing the, the fuel that's coming out and it's CO2 by CO2 that we put underground. This is not science fiction. This is technology that's been applied for the past 20, 25 years. Not far from here. Well, I'm not in Morocco. I'm sorry, I gave that talk in Morocco also. That's in Algeria. There's a major, major uh, Insalah uh, gas plant owned by BP that uses exactly this technology, that they inject CO2 underground <coughs> to pressurize the gas field and produce more gas. You can tell definitely that's Algeria, right? Um, there are similar plants in Malaysia. There's a plant in Norway. And this map shows dots for different areas where these sort of plants have either been considered or under consideration or implemented. <clears throat> While doing all of this, it's hopefully I, I, I had said that before, but I will say it again, you must consider the economics. You must consider the uh, uh, price added or price, price assigned to each one of these technology. There's a complex chart shows a levelized cost of electricity from different sources of energy using different technologies. <clears throat> you need not look at the detail. You need just to see that this is uh, expected prices for natural gas plant with carbon capture and storage as compared to these. So there's about 20 to 30% increase in the price, as I mentioned before. You must keep in mind that this increase can indeed hurt the value of the economy as you compare it to things like geothermal energy, wind energy, or PV energy. <clears throat> okay. On the other hand, keep in mind that wind and PV have, do not have the storage price built in them, while the CCS plant can run 24 hours a day. <clears throat> so while it seems to be more expensive, it may not be as expensive as we think, since compared to other zero carbon energy, <coughs> it, it, it has the edge of no need for storage. Uh, this is another uh, thing along the same line that, uh, again, uh, uh, in the US, between the US and Canada, there are several <coughs> uh, examples. This one particular example, a plant in the North Dakota that actually burns coal and pipes the CO2 over to Canada to help extra production of oil from one of the Canadian oil fields. This is a system of pipelines that move CO2 around in the US, mainly taking CO2, believe it or not, from underground to repressurize Texas oil fields to produce more electricity. There's been more talk recently about using CO2 both for the production of fuel, and I mentioned that, as well as using it in production of soda. Anytime you drink soda, you are injecting, ingesting some CO2 that was produced somewhere, potentially in cement, as well as other building material. All right, let's move on to uh, a very important point, which is developing local economy. Any of these technologies is not going to happen by itself. 
you can import it or you can produce it locally. If you want to produce it locally, you have to get yourself up to speed with uh, state-of-the-art science and engineering. So these are just some, some examples I pulled without any particular uh, uh, reason, except to say that technology is being developed for deployment, and if the deployment is going to happen economically, one must think of also participating in the manufacturing and the development of that technology. So the city of the future should not be only a user of new technology for clean energy, it should be also a producer. <clears throat> Let me switch to another subject that uh, may every once in a while escape our attention, which is biomass. Um, not too many know, but 10% of the energy produced worldwide comes from biomass. That's a very surprising figure. <clears throat> and I'm talking about primary energy. And the reason for doing that, for, for that, is because there are about 2 billion people around the world that we do not have access to any other form of energy. It's hard to say that in the 21st century, but that's true. Uh, Southeast Asia and Africa in particular is the rural communities there, and there are many of them <coughs> are primarily, primarily dependent on biomass. On the other hand, people who study the economics of using renewable energy or any other form of energy to look at the cost always associate certain technology with reduction of cost cost and other technology with increase in cost. And biomass always comes in in the reduction of cost. Because biomass, by definition, is almost a zero energy source, depending on how you use it, <coughs> a zero CO2 source, depending on how you use it. And <coughs> it can help you with a reduction of CO2, again, if you use it correctly. Now, <coughs> I'm not going to get a, into a lecture on biomass. I'll just say that uh, the Current practices of using biomass in rural communities is terrible. It produces enormous, enormous air quality issues in places like India. If you go to India, in particular northern India, in uh, um, November, December, early January, you get into what the New York Times calls the gas chamber. <clears throat> and that happens because agricultural communities around it burn the biomass in open fields and, and produces tons of soot and unburned hydrocarbon. There are many, many ways of converting biomass to, to fuels. Some of them produce solid fuels called torrefaction or producing biochar. Some of them produces gaseous fuels, either by anaerobic digestion or gasification. And some of them produce liquid fuel by flash pyrolysis. Uh, we, my group, and others have been very interested in the solid fuel production because solid fuels are much easier to transport and store. In other words, the biochar. And we've had a couple of several students actually working on developing both the thermochemistry, the knowledge base for how you convert biomass into solid fuel, and bench top scale uh, uh, reactors to perform this function, and is currently being scaled up into sort of pilot scale, and we're hoping to uh, demonstrate the effectiveness of that in, in India as, as a first application, and <clears throat> potentially second in Egypt, because Egypt has a very, very similar problem that's actually from the leading newspaper in Egypt, complaining about the same issue, and potentially again in Kenya. Turns out that biochar is also a good soil enhancer, so it has, does have that added capability. Same thing can be said about biomass gasification, production of gas from biomass as a fuel that's easy to use and clean and easy, easy to, uh, to transport. Again, there's an uh, enormous opportunity to, 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 to develop knowledge, science, engineering technology around gasification of biomass <coughs> to go from pictures like these where burning is, is pretty pretty nasty into a much cleaner system. I should also talk about waste disposal. Uh, waste disposal is a big, massive problem for many cities. Uh, cities like New York City, they put their waste on trains and send them somewhere else, I shouldn't say where, Alabama. But um, uh, 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 the higher the density of the population, the, the, the bigger the problem of, of waste disposal becomes. So the 
big opportunity in developing technology in that area. We and others are working on things like uh, uh, supercritical water oxidation technologies for doing that. And <clears throat> the objective is to be able to not only dispose of the waste, but also generate some energy in the process. Because most, most waste has very, very uh, uh, high energy content, but is critical to harness. I should say, and I, I forgot to mention that in the beginning, is many of these technology concepts tend to be what we call dual use or multi-use concepts. Technologies that can be used in different applications depending on the need. The supercritical water idea came from work we were doing with Aramco, your own oil company, to upgrade oil. So it had nothing to do with waste, actually upgrade poor quality oil. While we were doing this, we stumbled on the idea that the same thing can be used to either burn waste or, or gasify waste by, by adjusting the reactor conditions. So that, that gives another twist on the idea of developing economies in new cities that, that focus on, on use of clean energy, that many of the technologies that need to be used for clean energy production can also be used for other applications. All right, now I'm, I'm getting close to that end here. One thing I should say that if you develop that sort of economy that combines uh, rationally and carefully fossil fuels and, 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 and clean energy, not only you can export oil, but you can also export the clean energy. Uh, you can export the clean energy or you can export uh, uh, other products of the clean energy. And while you're doing this, you can also think of using your fossil fuel for value-added products. Not all fossil fuels should be burned to produce energy. Many of them are used to produce rubber, plastic, polyester. Many, many products you may not think of are produced by gas or oil for use, for, for actual consumption. And as we grow more prosperous, we need more of that. Obviously, that needs chemistry. Need, need, I remind you that chemistry or alchemia was invented in the Arab world way back in the early days of the Islamic civilization. So we should be good at it. We should go back to chemistry and figure out how to develop the right chemistry to be more efficient in using our hydrocarbon resources and things besides combustion. Not only we can export the products of, of oil to chemicals, but if we develop that clean energy economy correctly, we can take advantage of an enormous project that was under research in Europe for many years. It's called the Desert Tech Project. Now, the Desert, Desert Tech Project as shown here was a about deploying solar and wind energy technology all around North Africa and the Arabian Peninsula uh, in form of both PV systems, uh, CSP systems, as well as wind systems. And the estimates that were made was that <coughs> that will more than satisfy the need of both the local area as well as the entire continent of Europe both in energy and in water desalination. So developing that new energy economy in, 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 in a place like here will set the stage for projects like these to start to become real. Uh, there are several reports I encourage you to look at if you're interested. <coughs> that was put by, by Fraunhofer Institute in Germany uh, showing uh, detailed uh, both economic as well as technical analysis of, of the desert, desert tech project. I cannot end by before reiterating what I said before, that to develop that clean energy economy, you need to develop knowledge around it before it and while you're doing it. We are in KAUST, and KAUST is all about developing knowledge. Uh, certainly, KAUST can play a very much of a leading role in that development. I argue that uh, more cows are needed if this sort of change is going to happen. That knowledge is going to cover engineering, science, incubation, investment, commercialization, entrepreneurship, 
<clears throat> many, many things have to happen in order for these kind of new technologies to come out at scale <clears throat> and, and become sort of the, 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 the new and, and dominant form. Finally, I will say that a city of the future must be smart, clean, and adaptable. I think I said that in the beginning. <clears throat> the communication infrastructure that allows things like, like self-driving cars and so on, allowing switching from different sources of energy as, as, as uh, different sources become available, integrating them <clears throat> in ways that, that uh, uh, takes advantage of the maximum efficiency, integrating energy production with water desalination, with irrigation as needed, <clears throat> all of that is important. I shouldn't finish without saying anything about nuclear energy. Uh, I strongly believe, although I'm not a nuclear scientist by any stretch of imagination, that nuclear energy is going to have to continue to play a very important role in the low carbon mix of energy. <clears throat> nuclear energy is the easiest energy to scale. There are issues and there are problems, and we can talk about that, <clears throat> but it's nothing, nothing beyond our, our engineering capability. There are new technologies under development now. There are new companies that are actually leading these, developing small-scale modular power plants, much smaller than they used to be, that can be built in factories and moved over on, of, on trucks <clears throat> to where they can get assembled. They reduce the risk, both accident risk and cost significantly. There are also very important and interesting technologies being developed not only to use nuclear energy for, for electricity production, but also for fuels production, <clears throat> as well as chemicals. Anytime you have CO2 and water, you can produce all kinds of chemicals that you want to see. All right, with that, I go back to my, my original theme that uh, it's, it's my, my strong belief that uh, clean energy, as defined by a portfolio <laughs> variety of what, what we introduced uh, is an enormous opportunity for developing uh, cities of the future, especially and particularly if you combine the deployment of the technology with the development, the research and development needed, as well as job creation for <coughs> scaling these technologies up. Now I'd like to wrap up. <coughs> um, I've already mentioned that it really is a question of deploying a portfolio of solutions that combine both renewable as well as, as, as fossil energy sources in a smart and, and uh, effective way, <coughs> taking advantage of potential economic op opportunities associated with it. Already mentioned that the sustainability and resilience must be important attributes for the city of the future, and it must be considered in connection with developing prosperity and quality of life. <clears throat> um, city of the future must be smart, must develop knowledge, de generate knowledge, not just import it, and much all, must, must also encourage enterprising spirit, must be very entrepreneurial. Uh, a, a new development, a green field, is always a grand opportunity to implement all of this in an organized and a synergistic way. And while doing this, as I said in the second slide, we must stay flexible because this field is changing and changes very quickly <coughs> and in ways that it's not, not always predictable. Finally, I'd like to show you some, some green pictures of my students at different times of the past few years, uh, just simply to thank them for all their contribution, everything I said and everything I know, I learned from them, <clears throat> so they deserve a big thank you. And uh, given the fact that these pictures are very green, mostly were taken as I, I, either at MIT or my, or my own backyard, I should say that the city of the future should also be green, because green means a CO2 sink. I talked all about the sources and reducing the sources, but also accounting for the fact that there are sinks of CO2, CO2 like forests and, and parks and greeneries. I believe that the city of the future must have as many of those as possible. With that, I thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer any questions.
caught. All right. Uh, thank you very much for your for the very interesting talk. I, I have a question. You know, one of the themes was that uh, energy should be uh, uh, generated locally. Uh, yet, like for example, geothermal energy, which is also a very renewable energy source, uh, hardly ever features. And I wonder whether it's not like another one of these Porsche things that uh, you know we know it's there, but nobody spends any money on it and develop does it's not really developed. Thank you very much for bringing it up. I, I struggled whether I should add it to the mix or not. And to its credit, I should say that geothermal energy is the only unique energy that's non-intermittent. So it has a very important attribute. Once you drill a hole and <coughs> get hot water from underground for the next three to five years, depending on the life, lifetime of the hole, you can get hot water around the clock, which means that you can run your power plant around the clock. You don't deal with all the intermittency problems. Uh, on the other hand, the reason I left it out, uh, well, two reasons I left it out. One is because while, again, the other two types, the wind and solar, have been growing very fast, uh, because they are a bit less location dependent. There is a bit more, uh, you disagree, all right. <laughs> um, so the, 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 the growth in, in these two, most of us believe is less location dependent. <coughs> and in a, in a place like Saudi Arabia, the western, western side of Saudi Arabia with the enormous resources of solar as well as wind, it's very likely that they will be the more uh, both economically and convenient uh, uh, renewable energies of the world. <clears throat> Clearly, new cities have an advantage because they don't have existing infrastructure they have to replace. But if you look at existing cities, do you have examples of cities that are making good choices in converting their power as, a, as sort of role models for the world? Absolutely. Um, I, I, one, one thing that comes to mind is San Diego. San Diego has been working very hard to um, develop California largely, but San Diego has one city since you asked about cities, to develop renewable energy fields outside of its own uh, boundaries <coughs> and pipe that energy back, electricity back to the cities. While they're doing this, they ran into the problem of the intermittency as well as uh, storage. So while they're thinking about deploying the uh, solar and, and, and wind energy outside, they're also thinking of building a pumped hydro power plant. So they went out, I forget exactly the location, I looked at it before, but I don't remember it now, <coughs> somewhere um, east of San Diego Again, there is geologic formation that will allow them to fill in a big hole in the ground that looks like a lake and use it as a pumped hydro system. <coughs> so cities that have already developed and are, are basically uh, you know, reliant on, uh, on a grid are now looking at supplying the grid with other sources of energy. But when they think about the scale, they are also thinking about the storage uh, set of issues associated with it. Um, regarding the storage with uh, hydro pump, and coming from a country that uh, broke a world record last March, r Portugal, yep. one month running with renewable energy, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. the question of pumped hydro in countries that are subjected to climate change and that we know for a fact that for future scenarios the, <laughs> the um, water um, availability will be less and we as a country we also suffer that in the year before so this is also cause a, a future challenge for managing energy absolutely that's that's the reason why i mentioned uh, um, pumped hydro as an existing, sim relatively simple available technology. 
But moving forward, I strongly believe it's going to have to be either chemical energy storage or electrical storage or even thermal storage. It's either going to be generation of synthetic fuels using elec renewable electricity or renewable heat or um, uh, uh, some form of thermal energy storage, whether it's fire brick storage or uh, molten salt storage and, and so on. <coughs> uh, or electrical, massive, massive plant, massive uh, uh, factories of batteries <coughs> connected in, in, in series. Uh, I, I, I think that hydro is an absolutely fantastic technology if you have the right geography. Okay, I, I, I think I mentioned, I mentioned the connection with the geography. And even if you have the right geography, it's not always obvious that hydro is the best solution because hydro plants also generate their own environment around them and can impact the local ecology, not always in the positive way. And there are several examples of that. Uh, also, big hydro plants can cause all kinds of political problems. I don't know whether you're aware of the hydro plant being built in, in Ethiopia and <coughs> the problem with, with the Nile water in Egypt and so on. So hydro plants and pump hydro systems are ideal if you have the right geography and, 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 and control over water resources, but are not the solution for everyone, especially in a desert environment. And I did show Jordan's project, which is under consideration. It's not a simple and easy project, but it's, it's what they figured might be the best, uh, might be the best for their own application. Um, I have one question regarding the management of the supply and demand of the energy in the city. Since you, <laughs> you defend the distributed systems, I can imagine that there will be uh, different companies generating electricity. So do you believe in a centralized system to manage the, the supply mm. and demand or an electricity market where the companies sell the electricity and there yeah. are resellers, retailers and all the electricity market framework? Yeah, that's a, that's a complex question. I'm not sure I'm, I'm, I'm totally equipped to, 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 to give you a final answer on it. <clears throat> the question is, if we're going to have distributed supply, and especially if we're going to allow distributed suppliers to sell their, their energy, not just to generate it for their own use, how are you going to manage this? And how are you going to set the prices? It's a big, big problem now because, for instance, in the U.S., if you have a PV system on the roof of your house, you are allowed to sell power back to the grid. But their distribution, companies that own the distribution system are complaining very, very loudly that that means that me as a generator is using the distribution system for free. I'm not paying them. The distribution system is like a highway system. I'm sending the electricity I'm generating to you without charging, without being charged for it. Uh, and it's a question of how do you price that step in, in the process is, is, is complicated. And I, and I think there has to be some level of centralized management. I mean, I, I think that's sort of the <coughs> uh, common wisdom, so to speak, how that system is going to de be deployed and how the system is going to monitor and change the pricing during the day and during the season and so on is obviously something that will have to be worked out. And, and again, that, that goes back into the whole smart city and <coughs> uh, monitoring and, and, and sensing and actuation and responses and so on. That, that will have to be integrated in, in developing that power grid. But, but that's definitely one of these areas where significant progress will have to be made in order to address this. All right, on this, uh, I think it's a good time to, uh, for all of us to take a break. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Ahmed. It's been a wonderful lecture and a um, quite a nice discussion after that. As is our custom, we have a present for you and I'd like us to take a picture. Oh.